it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to chat. Yeah, you know, as we talked about uh, beforehand, um, I kind of came across you. You wrote a great leadership article not so long ago, um, how to develop a personal leadership philosophy. That really resonated with me. And the individual on your team uh, who reached out, you such a great professional approach in uh, engaging that I just had to talk with you. So <laughs> that's what uh, brings us here together today. I'm glad to hear that our team represents us well, and uh, now <laughs> you and I are connected, so that's great. So as I understand it, the focus of your firm is on personal branding, particularly for certain audiences, authors and other, others like that. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about you know, who you represent and what you do, and then I have some questions on personal branding. Sure, absolutely. And I geek out on this stuff, so uh, <laughs> feel free to stop me if I'm going too long, but this is really my passion. And so I've been working with authors and speakers specifically for about 15 years now, and in that journey, uh, a partner and I decided that we needed to figure out a way to help people with tremendous content, just like you, but uh, other authors and speakers as, as well, we call those personal brands, mm -hmm. try to help those folks monetize their content online. So what is a speaker doing in between honorariums? And what is an author doing in between book royalty checks to make revenue? And uh, that's what our firm really specializes in. We help people find a specific audience online, uh, gather that audience together, uh, nurture that audience with tremendous valuable content, and then eventually walk that audience through to a purchase of an online product. So um, we're kind of lumped into a, a services firm, an agency mm -hmm. of sorts, but really when you hone it down, it's to take personal brands and help them uh, find an audience online and then monetize their content to that audience. You know, I, it, it obviously near and dear to my heart, given the work <laughs> that I do, but I imagine that uh, uh, there's great demand for it. So what I'd like to do is maybe unpack this concept of personal brand a little bit. Sure. You know, I think that term, at least I first became aware of it when Tom Peters wrote his, what I believe is a classic article in Fast Company, I think 1997, um, that dates me a bit, but oh yes, I was reading Fast Company and I was in the tech arena and that was right when the, you know, the dot-com boom was beginning to take place. And he came out with this, the brand called you. And, and since then, it's almost become a bit of a, I don't know, I don't want to say cliche, but what, what is personal brand today? What's involved with a personal brand and who needs one? Man, that is, uh, that's a great question. I love it. Um, that is, that's the question that everybody's asking. So you've got some kind of expertise. You've got some kind of uh, passion in your own life. And you believe, hopefully, that that material could help others. Then in a way, that's kind of the first qualifier for mm -hmm. me as to mm -hmm. what a personal brand could be. Now, there's a couple of differences that I try to emphasize when somebody's asking me this question. Number one, and I think Tom, this is what he was doing in that late 90s article, is talking about you and, and Art, let's just use you as the example. You are obviously a successful uh, business person, tremendous background, you've managed, you've led, you've written, and all of those things are a part of you, but Art, the brand, is different than Art, the person. And uh, treating art, the brand, just like you would treat Coca-Cola or just like mm -hmm. you would treat Disney. It is a business. Now, I'm not going to put words in your mouth and say that you're in this just for the money. But at <laughs> some point, this is a business. And, and most people would like for it to be a revenue generator. Sure, and, sure. And, and so uh, a personal brand is being able to distinguish between who I am as, uh, as an individual, gathering all of my experiences, but then being able to formulate document and present those experiences to others. Uh, and right now, online is one of the best ways to do that, but there's many different ways to present your content. But figuring out a way to present that to an audience, and I think those are, those are really some of the qualifiers that, that make a personal brand. Oh, so, so well said. That was like a, uh, a marketing uh, 150 course in personal <laughs> branding, all in a few sentences. Thank you. Right. Yes. You know, so I having, and I'm, I'm just thinking back on my own journey. Something interesting happens, by the way. I had a great career in the software and tech world. We sold our company. It had been a turnaround. We grew it into the market leader. It really was kind of a, you know, almost a storybook type scenario, aside from the fact that when we sold the company, I ended up leaving a team that I loved. That's another story. So it wasn't so storybook. And then I decided to set out and do some things on my own. What I learned quickly was, 
Well, there were elements of that kind of corporate persona that still hunted in the market. Mostly, I had to start from ground zero and begin to build a brand. And I wish I would have known you 10 years ago because I think <laughs> I made every mistake you can possibly make, probably still making some. You know, that's interesting though, and you're certainly not alone, but uh, one of the things I've noticed, and, and this is why I have a business, to be very frank with you, this is why Leverage Creative Group exists is because highly creative individuals are outstanding at creating content. And typically, they're not outstanding at building the back end or building the business side of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what I've figured out is I've got to help people stay in their lane. And so that allows them the, the best option, the best opportunity to create mm -hmm. the best content that they're capable of. And then me and my team can kind of come alongside them and handle all of that back end stuff, which so often frustrates and even, you know, prohibits some people from actually moving forward in this arena. No doubt. So let, let's take the case of someone who I guess, uh, you know, resembles my background. I have to imagine that, that that's not uncommon, right? You get corporate person of some sort, exec, whatever it happens to be, transitions into a solo life, decides to write a book, which was the first thing I did. By the way, nobody told me writing a book was a not-for-profit experience <laughs> while you were writing the book. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And then I did. I came home from a conference at Kellogg Northwestern one day when blogging was kind of just beginning to gain steam. And said, "I think I'll start a blog." And 1,600 articles <laughs> later, I've had a lot of. It's been spectacular. But right. I, what should that individual do? You know, versus my wander through the woods of personal branding. Wow. Well, I think you're providing some great resources for people. Uh, so one of my first advice uh, points to, to anyone wanting to do this is to study the market. Uh, you've already done a good bit of that. I've noticed your name pops up as uh, one of the, the top leadership blogs on a few different websites. And so it's clear you're providing some great resources for folks. But that's really one of the first things is mm -hmm. if you want to enter a market, and this is true in any business, not just in personal branding, but if you want to enter the marketplace and eventually carve out your own piece of that market, you've got to study the market. You've got to know what's out there, what seems to be working, what seems to not be working. Uh, there's tons of stuff that can be learned ahead of time. I think where a lot of people struggle in this arena is that they're so eager and so ready to make that transition from a corporate career to a solo venture or from uh, I've been a follower all this time. It's time for me to jump out there and be a leader or a mm -hmm. voice in this industry. They're so eager to make that transition happen that oftentimes they'll skip steps one through 10 and, and jump right to step 11. And if, and if you haven't done the first several things, then step 11 leads to uh, some frustration and right. money and you're, you're, you're stuck. And so um, that's, uh, you know, that's not uncommon at all. You're right. You know, I, I just, I've run across so many individuals that are struggling to get traction in this area. So I, I wonder if you actually know how big your potential is with your business, because there's just a <laughs> lot of folks trying for help. When, when I think on my own, own story, I actually made two mistakes. Um, well, first of all, I guess I recognized that, you know, you come out of the corporate world, you know, teams of hundreds and, and what have you. I literally didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> I had historically had a team for, yeah, you can relate to that. Yeah, for those of you who can't see if this is on audio, David, just give me the thumbs up. Yes, that's me as well. <laughs> and, and then the other thing was that I decided, I like to do so many things that I just said, sure, I can do that. Sure, I can do that. Sure, I can do And I figured things out. But I, I created this kind of dilution and didn't really carve out a specific you know, persona, target market, uh, value proposition. I didn't do any of that right. So is that something you help clients with? It absolutely is. And it's essential. And uh, again, you're not alone in that. Uh, the temptation when starting in this personal brand space is to do exactly what you just said. You want to be all things to all people because anybody who knocks on your door, you're not yet willing or ready to say no because you say, I, I got to figure out a way to move forward. So yes, I will do whatever it is that this person needs, mm -hmm. which on the surface sounds like it's a, a decent idea, but long-term you're not building any credibility. You're not building any authority. You're not building any expertise or audience to eventually sell a book or an online product to. So it's absolutely essential to identify that target market. And what I try to tell people is that, 
whatever your target market is, especially as you're starting out, whatever your target market is today, that does not mean that that has to be your permanent target market. Great it point. Does, it, it does mean that you have to have one today. You've got yeah. to have something to go after today. And after you build up that credibility a year from now or five years from now, of course you'll have opportunities to expand and to add to that. But you can't start off being an expert in five different areas in this personal brand space because there is no expert in five different areas from day one. Uh, you've got to start somewhere. Sure. Well, well said. So um, and, and the challenge too that uh, I see many people run into is they kind of, as did I, they sort of pitch their tent in an arena that's so big and noisy. I mean, leadership. I recall sending proposals out for my first book, and I, I won't use verbatim the exact words, but the agent's response to me was, oh, great, another blanking leadership <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Or, or the, that old staple rejection letter of this doesn't meet a current need. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. That, that's you know, I mean, so how, how do you narrow down? Um, you know, a lot of people go to passion, what they like. Um, I, I kind of look for people to hit the that convergence of, hey, you've got background and ability, so you've got some wisdom, you're interested in it, and you can figure out how to monetize it. I sort of look, if that's a Venn diagram, three circles, I look for the convergence of those. Is that Absolutely. something that makes sense? It really does. I think, uh, you know, our, there's, there's a few different ways to look at it. I think you've got to figure out the right way in your own brain to look at it. And that one sounds that one sounds great. I'd actually love to see that mapped out because I can kind of visualize it in my head. But one way that we look at it as well, um, I think a lot of people get stuck on, uh, on the passion part of that equation. Mm. And it can be limiting not only internally, but it for me, I've really seen that it can be limiting in terms of market appeal. And here's what I mean by that. I think, I think you've got to, you have to care about what you're doing. So I don't want to dismiss passion at all. But the way that I've been thinking about these things is that you've got to match what you care about with your expertise and your ability to convey that passion, but it has to meet a market need. So if you're passionate about something that the market doesn't care about, you're, you're never going to get the results that you think you can. So if you're only creating content that is of, of appeal to you, then you've really limited your target market. Because you know, and I have a, a, a non-scientific perspective that that may be one of the biggest traps people fall into. It really is. It really is. And I think that's where people need, if nothing else, need some additional perspective when going down this journey. So there's, we're certainly not the only company that does this. There's others out there, but even if you don't hire or, or bring on a partner to help you in this journey, just having conversations like this mm -hmm. to say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about and to get some, some wise outside counsel uh, on the situation and on what you think you want to deliver to the market testing that out with some, some trusted voices first. That's a really good idea. It sounds like it's, you know, that commercial priceless. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. It can save you and can save you years. Sure. It can save you decades even. So let's talk about the two B's, books and blogs. Um, <laughs> you want to start out, you're coming out of the world, you've got a great history at background. Do you need to lead off with a book? What's your perspective on that? You know, I, I really do. This is, this is a terrible answer, so please <laughs> for, forgive me. But I really do believe that it changes based on the person. If you're okay. capable of writing a terrific book that delivers outstanding value, then absolutely that's where you should start. But as you know, not everybody can do that. <laughs> Not everybody can write a book. Uh, a lot of people get terrified by the overwhelming uh, volume or the page count, the word count of writing a book, um, the outline. They don't know how to compile it. So it might not be the best thing for everybody, but you do have to find out the best way for you to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if that's a podcast, if it's video interviews, audio interviews, YouTube videos, uh, consistent emails, if it's just blogging, uh, if it's a book, if it's creating an online course, there's a variety of different options. Uh, so that I don't think it's a one size fits all solution. I do think that you've got to figure out a way to, uh, to communicate best for you that also meets the need of the market. So that's, uh, th those that's are the a great answer. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. I, I think spot on voice of experience there. 
So uh, one last question on, on the book front. Um, obviously, it's hard given the competition for many to gain a formal publishing relationship. You know, self-publishing and the services are all over the place. Is there still a negative stigma associated with that? There certainly seemed to be 10 to 15 years ago. You're right. There definitely was. I do think it's going away uh, mm -hmm. with every passing year. Uh, I still tell people to exhaust every opportunity for a traditional publishing deal mm -hmm. before they move forward with self-publishing. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with self-publishing if you do it the right way and if you make sure that it is as high quality as you can afford to make it. Uh, because there's some cost involved to, mm -hmm. to self-publish. Obviously, the, the profit margin on a self-published book is a little bit better than a standard <laughs> book royalty from a traditional publisher, but there's upfront costs and all the marketing is, is on you. But I do believe the stigma is going away a little bit. Uh, you know, one thing, and this is not exactly what you asked, but I, I want to, uh, like I said, I geek out on this stuff. Yeah, so I just, sure. I sure. Go, go, go with it. But I... Uh, the book question, uh, a lot of people have asked me, hey, I, I want to go ahead and write a book. And my response is great. If you feel like you're supposed to do that, then, then more power to you, go for it. My follow-up question to that is, who are you going to sell it to? Hmm. And m most people do not have an answer to that. Most people have not thought about who is the market going to be, especially if I'm going to self-publish this. If somehow you get a traditional publishing deal, that helps in terms of distribution because those publishers have access to a lot of people that you don't. Right. But if you're going to go the traditional publishing route, then you've got to find the audience and you've got to figure out a way to sell that. So is, is there an audience existing? Do you have, for example, an email list? And I know you've got a, a pretty sizable <laughs> email list. So you have an audience that you can, can uh, reach with those opportunities, but most people don't. And so you can write the best book in the world. You could write the book that, could change millions of lives, but if you don't have an audience to sell it to, mm -hmm. then it will just sit dormant on Amazon or on your website or, or whatever. So, or even, or even worse, you'll take delivery of a few hundred copies and they'll sit in your garage or your basement. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, that uh, that is way too common in this industry for no sure. No doubt. Well, how about how about blogging? Is that still a, a good way to build visibility, get your voice out there? I definitely think it is. I think, again, it's, it's shifted a little bit uh, because mm -hmm. so many people are blogging right. now. Uh, the, the competition um, is really, it's just almost overwhelming, which enhances the need to have a target audience. I also think it really means that anytime you communicate with that audience, anytime you write a blog and then push it out to your list, uh, it needs to be of high value. And so many times people, especially five or 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, I've got a blog three times a week, or I've got a blog, uh, you know, five times a month or whatever it is. I really think those quote unquote rules have gone out the window. Okay. And I think the most effective way to do it is to figure out a consistent timeline to deliver content and then stick to it. Now, one thing that a lot of people misunderstand when I say that is they think that consistent means constant. It doesn't. Consistent for you might be once a month, right. and that's totally fine. Um, but whatever consistent is for you, tell your audience what they can expect from you and then actually deliver on it. Because if you can do those things, you'll already be doing better than what most people online are, are able to do. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I'm thinking about it. There are a number of bloggers that I follow that I love. And the one gentleman, uh, is an executive coach, Ed Batista, I'm happy to mention his name. He writes in like spurts. He'll come out with two or three really quickly, and then, then he'll disappear for a month. He's a busy guy. He's coaching. He's running right. workshops and programs. But when I come back to his site and find a fresh one, that's just like finding a buried treasure. It's just fantastic. It's so exciting. It yeah, is. and I don't care that he doesn't do it regularly. I, you know, I well, catch it when I catch it. And you're obviously evidence that what he's doing is working because he's created brand loyalty. He's created trust. He's created authority. You know right. that if he's put something out, it's of the highest quality and he's not just, you know, churning out random useless content just for the sake of trying to, to stay on your top of mind. Uh, that's, that's tremendous. He's developed there are a great... more than a few bloggers that I think fall into the category. <laughs> I will not name names. However, this right. is a yes. family show. So <laughs> right. most of us have uh, those fake email addresses designed specifically specifically for those. All of those emails. Right. Right. Hey, so speaking of blogging, um, I, you know, I really enjoyed yours. Often what I anticipate when I show up at a, you know, a service provider's blog might be something that's uh, an awful lot of pitch. 
And what I got from you was just a, a great blend of education on the personal branding and the you know, various services that you guys touch, but without that pitch tinge. And then some fabulous leadership content. And that sort of, mm. I don't know why it surprised me, but it did. So why, why are you uh, interested in writing about leadership? Well, it's interesting for me because, as I mentioned to you before we started, I've been, I've been kind of behind the scenes for 15 years of mm -hmm. other authors and speakers, a lot of them in that personal development and leadership category. So I've observed for quite a while. I've read tons of books. I've, I've studied people. I've worked under and for and on behalf of many of them. And that's been terrific. Uh, the opportunity to start my own company put me in the position of saying, I've got to figure out how to actually put this stuff into practice. Mm -hmm. uh, much like you, you know, I was in the corporate world for a while and even managed teams up to 15 or 20 people, right. not the size that you've managed before, but, uh, but still, uh, you know, a decent number of people. But I was never the, the final word. I was never the decision maker for the business mm -hmm. uh, until Leverage Creative Group started. And my co-founder and I decided, you know, one of our tenants is going to be to always be learning, uh, to then surround experts with other experts, and then share that expertise with as many people as we can reach. And so what we decided was, hey, it's clear we've never done this, but we're not going to shy away from documenting our process as we build this company learning as fast as we can and then sharing that expertise with others. So everything you've read on our, on our blog is it's really just a documenting of our journey, growing this business while doing it, uh, helping, you know, professional development authors and speakers, helping them get their message messages to others. So it's a, it's a self-reflective kind of thing. Um, I, I hope that there's value in it, but uh, I know that I, I'm certainly learning while writing some of these things. I think it's fabulous. No, it's great that you're kind of chronicling the, uh, you know, the evolution of the firm and, and your leadership journey and, your, and, and the journey with your colleagues there. So help me understand, what type of culture have you worked to develop within your firm? That is, uh, it's in process. That's the <laughs> first thing. Um, I don't think we will ever reach the point where we say we're done uh, yeah, sure. developing this culture, but we're, we're very much in process. You know, I've come from, uh, I worked for clear channel radio right out of college. So I worked for a mega media conglomerate. Then I worked for a speakers bureau uh, for five years, booking keynote speakers. Uh, that was another corporate environment. Then I was a, a head of operations for an artist management company. And in each of those situations, I found that I, I wasn't fully comfortable with the amount of transparency that was available to the entire team. Now, that is not to badmouth any of my experiences. Sure. I thought I, I learned tremendously at each one. However, when I had the chance to start my own company, one of the things that I wanted to do was to make sure that uh, transparency was one of... Uh, if not the top thing on our list as it relates to culture. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no question that's off the table. Now, I might not give every single person every single detail about the <laughs> finances or the, uh, the ins and outs of what we're doing, but I do want people who are on our team to know what they can expect of me and my co-founder. I want them to know why we're doing what we're doing. And I believe in what we're doing enough to where I don't think there's anything for us to hide in any of those areas. So uh, the transparency, and really it goes beyond transparency, but just a, a, a real intentional communication structure mm -hmm. to say, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, and, uh, and this is what you can expect from us. So have you codified this in uh, terms of values or... Um, is it a component of your leadership philosophy that you articulate to people? How, how do people know this about you and about the firm? You know, that's, that's a great question. We've, uh, those three things I mentioned a minute ago, we make very public to, to really, really anybody, but to the mm -hmm. team starting off that, that these are our values uh, to always be learning, to surround experts with other experts, and then to share that expertise. So we're very clear about those right. things. I think the other thing that I've tried to figure out is uh, people and this is not new, but I'm, I'm living this right now. And things are always more potent when you experience them versus when you read them or when you hear them. And so I know what I'm about to say is not new at all, but 
I'm living it as though it's new. Um, and here it is. People on my team respond so much better and with so much more passion when they see and feel my, uh, my purpose, my mission, rather than just read it in our, our, hem, our handbook sure, or sure. on our website. And so I'm really trying to figure out ways to live out, uh, to live out those things rather than to say them. And so we have kind of documented some stuff, but our goal is to just live it and, and let it be a, let it be so obvious by the decisions that we make, the articles we write, the deals that we strike, um, the products that we sell, uh, how we sell them, let every decision that we're making reflect those things so that we don't have to just, you know, shove it down people's throats. They just, they just will know. Yeah, I love that. I love that perspective. So you're, you know, and if you have to obviously opt for one way, bringing them to life is much more potent than, for example, the framed artwork that ends up on the walls <laughs> of so many conference rooms and lobbies of firms. That's exactly right. With the eagle sitting on the, the high perch. Yes. <laughs> it may be in something encased in lucite as a, you know, in the old right. day, I'm, I'm dating myself, but lucite uh, in paperweight on the desk. Yes. And no offense to Mac Anderson, who started uh, Successories. Mac and I worked together for, for a little bit on that when he was doing some speaking. But, uh, but yeah, he founded that company and, and <laughs> tremendous work. But yeah, you're right. We, we're trying not to do that right now. You know, there does come in. This, this is a little bit of bias on my own background. I, I had a great chance to uh, join... Um, in, a, in kind of a return software executive career, I, I joined a software company out of Seattle for a few years. They had been a client and I really loved what they were doing, loved the people, loved the opportunities there. And in a, in a moment of weakness, I decided to join the company. I took the CEO <laughs> up on his offer and I was fascinated. I, I kind of wandered around and started asking people, you know, hey, I can see your pride. I can feel your pride in the firm, but what, what are the values that kind of drive this firm? And you know what was really funny? Nobody could articulate anything other than beer at 3.30 on Friday. <laughs> so they actually came up with the idea of, I guess you're right. Maybe it took the outsider kind of jumping in, but maybe we should get together. And so we, we actually uh, sponsored an initiative where the broader employee team wrote the values effectively wow. and debated those. And it was fascinating with as little executive oversight as possible. And it was just, <laughs> was, it was a remarkable learning experience to, uh, to see it unfold. And it really helped in the future in terms of uh, hiring, we had a rapid growth, bringing people in and getting them enculturated uh, into the organization. Sure. And there's a lot of value in what you just said that that group was, first of all, willing to have outside eyes. I yeah. mean, you became, you, you became part of the team, but to bring somebody from the outside and, and listen to their perspective, that's a huge thing because so often you can get kind of stuck looking at uh, the inside of the fishbowl. Um, that, that old quote of uh, uh, one fish asks the other, <laughs> how's the water today? And, and the other fish responds, what water? <laughs> So I'll attribute all, any, any of the credibility and their willingness to listen to the fact that I took the advice of one engineer on my first day who looked at me and said, look, we're glad you're here, but no one's going to listen to a guy in fancy pants. <laughs> From that point forward, I wore jeans when I was in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. No fancy pants in our office either. We're, we're, we're a jeans culture for sure. Right. So talk about this concept of uh, leadership philosophy a little bit. This, and and I, I, I'll share, this is really powerful for for many of my executive coaching clients, particularly people in CEO or other C-level type positions that are looking to kind of level up. And I'll work with them. And I, I don't call it a personal leadership philosophy, but I think you've nailed the concept much better than I have. So I want to learn from you here. Help us understand it and help us understand how you arrive at it. Sure. Well, again, this is, uh, th thanks for your kind words. I hope it is useful. I know it's useful to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, this is self-reflective. This is me documenting a mm -hmm. journey. I've never been a CEO before. I've been a, an account executive. I've been a vice president. I've been a COO. But until, you know, 20 months ago, I'd never been a CEO. Sure. And so I'm, I'm learning as I go here. And I encountered several things, specifically in the first year of our business, that I felt no one ever told me I would encounter. No one ever, I, I never read the book that said these things would happen when you start a business or these things <laughs> would happen when, you, when you're a CEO. Um, and one of those things was, you know, what do I do when I don't know what to do? Mm -hmm. and, and I gotta be honest with you, Art, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> I don't know, there's so many times that I don't know what to do. So I had to figure out, okay, 
you know, not knowing what to do is fine. Right. And it happens to all of us. And it's truly fine when it's inconsequential. But what, what about when it really means something? What about when your business is on the line or your biggest clients on the line or your team, your employees, your payroll? What about when those things are on the line and you don't know what to do? What's your next step? So I tried to figure out a way to document for me what's going to guide my decision-making process when I don't know what to do. Because there are certain things that are true regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to figure out, I used a couple of examples in that article, but really at the end, I tried to just document, here's the process I've gone through. Here's something I think could help others. And the short summary of it is to, to answer four internal questions, mm -hmm. then to document and answer three external questions uh, about realities that exist. And, uh, and then to start formulating the, the structure of what those answers look like. Um, but, but again, it really, for me, it just came down to how am I going to decide what my um, process is going to be when I run up against things that are unexpected and I don't know what to do? Uh, because frankly, that's, like I said, I mean, it's just happening. It happens all the time. So sure, I had sure. to have boundaries. I had to have something that helped me move the company forward. Because if I don't make those decisions, I mean, you know, the company is not going to, not going to exist very long. So what you, your uh, opening phrase there, maybe the greatest blog title I'd never thought of until now, what do I do when I don't know what to do? Mm. I, I encourage you to steal that one. If I use it, I'll give you attribution, <laughs> of course, but I encourage you to lock that one. That's fabulous. And that's it really is. the essence of the challenge, isn't it? It really is. And again, I'm sure somebody has written or talked about this before, but in my journey, I had never read anything in that vein. Mm -hmm. Um and it's not like I was expecting this to be simple. Um, I didn't think I would just step in and build a, an amazing company and be an awesome CEO from day one. But at the same time, there are tons of things that have happened that I, even in my best experience, still had no clue what, what to do. And so I found myself uh, facing that question mm -hmm. way too frequently to not document it. And so once I documented it for myself, I was thinking, well, maybe I'm not the only one. <laughs> maybe somebody else out there needs sure. some help with this. And, you know, and for uh, everyone who's listening, I'll absolutely share the link to the article from the show notes. So we'll, we'll have that in there. Tremendous. Um, so, you know, inquiring minds want to know what's the biggest or best lesson you've learned the hard way in your development as a leader? Oh, man. How much time do we have? We don't have enough time. <laughs> oh, you got, you know, you got to prioritize here. Pick one. Pick yeah, that's one and exactly go with it. Right. Yeah. right. Well, yeah, Gary Keller says in the one thing that the priority is not a, a pluralized word. It can only be <laughs> one thing. Right. Um, so I would say, gosh, you know, as much as I have been around others who do this, you know, whatever this is, uh, write and speak and, and the personal branding thing. Um, and as much as I've studied and read mm -hmm. as many conferences as, as I've attended, I feel like I am learning every day how little I actually know. <laughs> I mean, I, th I, I think that, and that's not a, that's truly not a, I'm not saying that out of, out of ego or, or humility. I just think the reality is the the more I get into this, I feel like the less, certain I am about my depth of knowledge. I feel like I've just scratched the surface. And, and the more that I study and read, the more I realize I need to keep studying and reading. Hey, David, I, I think it's an important point, And it's a creative answer um, to, to the dilemma. You know, we all run into in these positions, this kind of level back to your, what do I do when I don't know what to do? Um, I suppose it maybe flirts with the concept of imposter syndrome. Not that you have that, but where we oh, run no, into I something <laughs> where, we're, where we're in a role and we're supposed to know what to do and we just don't, you know, and you got to kind of figure it out. So, and, yeah. you, and you have that self-doubt that creeps into your mind. I certainly have lived that many times. Absolutely. And I don't know if you've ever struggled with this, but I, I struggle with it constantly is, um, am I qualified to write that type of article that you right. saw? The struggle that I went through to document that, to get it to our team, and then to put it out, uh, imposter syndrome is very real. 
And, you know, I'm sitting here saying, I'm, I'm 38 years old. I've never been a CEO before. What right do I have <laughs> to, to write anything in this vein that could be of use to anybody else? And so, you know, the reality is that everybody has something of value to share. And that's certainly what I would coach you or any other uh, person to do. But then applying that to my own life, whew, it, it's not easy. Challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well said. Well said. Okay, so as we kind of wind things down here a little bit, I want to jump back to the, the personal branding. We, we've got that individual listening, mid-career type professional, a lot of success thinking about taking it out uh, on his or her own. You know, what do you want them to avoid in the vein of you, you, you didn't necessarily read the book that said, hey, as CEO, don't do this. Uh, what do you want them to avoid? Let's give them the tips. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, number one, this is not about you. That's the first thing I would say is if you truly have a unique experience and you have a passion about delivering that experience and expertise to others, then you have to remember and keep really first and foremost in your mind that this is not about you. This is about the recipient. This is about people. We are all, especially in this industry, we are not in the book business. We're not in the speaking business. We're not in the digital course business. We are in the people business. And it has to be the number one focus for you for everything that you do because you've got to deliver value and you've got to distinguish yourself from other people out there so when I say it's not about you, I'm, I'm, I'm really specifically talking about every decision you make needs to be filtered through how is the audience going to benefit from and receive this. And this could be an email, it could be a blog post, it could be a product, it could be just the landing page of your website. I was talking with a, a former executive a couple of weeks ago and she sent me a link to her new speaker website. Mm -hmm. And again, we won't give, won't give names here because we're going to be kind, <laughs> but um, the entire website was about her and mm -hmm. it was about how great she is. And I can understand why someone would think that it's good to promote and focus on themselves. But as a consumer, if I go to that website and I don't know immediately what the value is for me, I'm done. There's way too many other people out there that I can go to. So uh, that's a long answer to your question. But that first... is a, a priceless answer, worth twice the price of admission <laughs> here. So <laughs> yes. don't make it all about you. Yeah, it on it. And that really ties together with your, your, your earlier comments on it. So what a great way to wrap things up. Um, where can people find more about you and your firm? Absolutely. LeverageCreativeGroup.com. I know it's a long URL. We looked into purchasing something shorter, but uh, haven't made that happen yet. But yeah, LeverageCreativeGroup.com. You can shoot me an email if you'd like, David at LeverageCreativeGroup.com. I would love to chat with anyone. But uh, that gives you a little brief overview as to who we are and what we do. But um, we're on a journey just like everybody else. I'm not sitting here saying that we're the best or that we know exactly what we're doing, but we do have some experience. We've got some proven track record and uh, happy to share that experience with others. Well, David, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for being here today and for sharing your story and your great wisdom. Art, thank you for having me and thanks for all the value that you deliver to, uh, to me and to so many others. My pleasure.